Are we live? Oh, all right. Hey, Doug. Hey, Adam. Nice to see you here. Hey, never follow a fool's fury. It's a tough That's gig. That's what I learned. It's a tough gig. So thank you to Ben and the company. Uh, this is really, really fun for me. Yeah. And, and the work that I've done with them has uh, not only been really fun, but it's something that really kept me going when the novel wasn't going quite so well. Uh, we worked on Monster in the Dark together, and that, um, it made writing fun again. Um, it was a blast to work with the actors, and that's a whole lot different from sitting in your room alone, mm -hmm. uh, watching words not come up on the screen. And uh, so yeah, I think, I think Monster really helped the book get finished. Um, Should we talk about your novel not going so well? Oh, we can. Should we start if there. We, uh, <laughs> no. Sure. <laughs> hey, thanks to the library and to Litquake yeah. and everyone who came out on this uh, rainy night. Um, it's a wonderful event, and Doug, to have you out here is a dream. When they proposed you coming to town, I was like, I got to be that person to make it happen. <laughs> and um, uh, I just remember, um, you know, the times when you were working on this book, and we were both in the Stegner workshop together, and I have <laughs> so many memories. One was um, when you'd hurt your back and you couldn't sit in the chair when we'd do workshops and you had to lay on the floor. <laughs> it was like there was a ghost in the room. <laughs> and Tobias Wolf would lead the workshop and he'd be like, what do you all think of the opening of Melinda's story? <laughs> we hear this strange voice. I think it should be third person. And it was dug <laughs> under the table. <laughs> so, I mean, we've, sh we've shared it all since the beginning. Uh, and it's... It's great to kind of have read this book as a novel in progress many years ago, to have read it with glee when it was going to be published, and to read it with um, uh, the curious other readers in mind as well. One thing I was curious about was just coma, the why coma question. And I drive down the 280, and you see the fields of glowing headstones and the big jets coming up out of SFO, and I'm driving down to Stanford to teach, and there's that one flag that's always at half mast. And I'm like, do they lower it, raise it, and lower it? Or do they just leave it there? The perpetual mourning flag. You know, what, what made you think that, that this was a place you'd want to reside as an artist um, for a novel? I, the, the germ of the novel came, uh, came to me actually while I was in grad school in Iowa. And I, uh, while I was in Iowa, um, I read in a newspaper that a kid had been tied up, tied to a tree and left for dead in a cemetery overnight on a night when it went well below freezing. And um, the senselessness and, and banality of, of the sort of actions that would create that, that would put him there, really, really struck me. And I, I knew that was something I wanted to work with in fiction. Um, and I tried to write it as a short story, which considering that the first draft of the novel came in at about 900 pages, um, <laughs> was probably a doomed venture, and I, I didn't get very far with it. Um, and I moved back out here and finally dug that story out of a desk drawer. And um, right about the same time, the Chronicle ran a feature piece on Colma. I think it was Halloween. They were doing a you know, spooky feature. Right. And, and I had never, I had lived in the Bay Area, Bay Area for a long time, and had never known anything about Colma. I knew it was that place with gravestones along 280, but that's about it. I knew it was that BART stop that sometimes is there and right. sometimes isn't. Um, and uh, and the more and so I read this piece and I said, oh wow, this this is where that cemetery story should get told. Um, and in, and I knew immediately that was a much better choice because this was home, the Bay Area. It made a lot more sense for me to be writing about a place I knew than about Iowa City where I was just um, passing through. And, uh, and it, at the same time, I also uh, found out that I had a friend who was a cop uh, in Broadmoor, Daly City. And, uh, and so all of those different elements just kind of came together. And I figured, well, let me see where this goes. It feels like you haunted that place, like you <laughs> drank at every bar and walked through every cemetery. How did you research? I mean, did you go kind of exist there? Uh, 
a little. I'm, I'm, there are some writers who, who will go and like take up residence in a place and get to know everybody and, and research intensely. And I'm really far too shy for that. Um, and there's no doubt I would have gotten better material, uh, but I'm not the kind of person that, that does that easily. But I did go, uh, hung out at Malloy's and had some beers and research and talking to people generally go better when there's a little bit of beer involved. Um, for me. And um, yeah, I walked around through the cemeteries. Uh, I got to do a ride along with the Colma cops one night. Please, please. <laughs> Let's share a little bit. Oh, of yeah. It was it's a big ride along. It's pivotal in the book when that's true. Kelly comes into being. Nothing in the ride along section of the book actually happened on my ride along. Um, they did not take me out and try to scare me with the big. <laughs> Stuffed <laughs> panther, um, but but there is a thing much like that uh, that they do scare the rookies with. Really? Yeah. Um, but yeah, we did uh, we did some uh, traffic stops, and you pull over somebody, and they're on probation, subject to search, and you they search the car, and then there's a crack pipe in the back seat, or um, you know, there's. It's the same stuff that, that cops in other towns, all down the peninsula, in the city, they're all dealing with the same stuff. Were you writing down cop talk code <laughs> and stuff like that? I was trying to be subtle about it. I was trying to just remember it. Did you have a bulletproof vest on? I did not. They just made me sign something that said if I got whacked, it, it was my own fault. <laughs> I, did a, I did a ride along in Phoenix one time researching a short story. I had a character who was a cop as well. And um, I think the cops saw me and they were like, Big white guy with a buzzed head. He's one of us. Because I rode with two white guys with buzzed hair. And they were like, I was in the back seat, and they'd be like, that guy's taillight looks out. Don't you think? <laughs> you know, and it was just like a whole night of violating people's civil rights. It was shocking. <laughs> and I wondered if I had had hair and looked a little differently, if I would have got that. I, uh, I didn't see any, see, I, I'm actually trained as a lawyer and I, I would think I would be like ready to hop on any civil We're rights. We're gonna get right? to that. Okay. Um, what, I mean, is the mayor of Colma here? Anyone on the Colma City Council? <laughs> we can speak freely Have you as well, gotten yeah. any um, feedback? I mean, did they give you the key to the city? Have the cops read this book? I mean. Uh, I, think, I think a couple of them have. I got a nice letter from the chief of police and I believe from one of the sergeants and from the city manager. Um, so yeah, some of them have read it, and uh, I'm really gr glad that it, uh, I, you never know what to expect, especially since the cops in the book are incredibly foul-mouthed, they, they do make mistakes, they, you know, they're, they're not always behaving impeccably, and, um, but it's nice to know, or at least my sense is that people, you know, were able to recognize it as fiction. Mm -hmm. um, because really what, what I saw was, I mean, it's boring to say this, but what I saw was complete professionalism. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe if I'd been bigger and more buzz cut, um, I would have seen a little more. I was chewing tobacco and smoking a cigar. And yeah. It was interesting to hear that you'd uh, begun the book in Iowa. Uh, because one thing I hear time and time again from, from the crew of writers that we know is that people tend to not write about the place that they're in, but that the place that they were in last, you know, that somehow it lives larger in their minds and that when we leave a place, I think there's a filter and all the mundanity falls away. And you just remember the interesting things and there's a kind of nostalgia develops and you start to, I don't know, psychically be there. And um, so it sounds like a really interesting feat to have written a novel about a place that you're living in. Except I did have that experience when I moved to Texas. Um, I mean, I wrote the f uh, almost the, the first two full drafts of the book while in San Francisco, and I moved to Austin in 2005, and, uh, and the entire third draft was while I was in Austin, and I very much had that experience of using the book to connect back to San Francisco, mm -hmm. and, and it, I think it made things easier, definitely, um, not just because I think that filter was working, I mean, I think that definitely happened, and also... I didn't really have the luxury of losing myself in research. I couldn't, you know, take a day to go down to Colma and scope out 
locations. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I was living in Texas. I had a deadline. I had to just make it up and move on. Mm -hmm. um, and that was probably something I, I needed to be able to do. So um, it was freeing, I, I suppose, as well, to be away from it. And one thing that, you know, it's a historical novel and a contemporary novel at the same time, which is quite a rare bird, I thought. And, um, you know, I read maybe in this amazing brochure. I was like, oh my God, <laughs> have you seen a brochure like this before? I also read the discussion questions, and I didn't know the answers to any of them. I was like, <laughs> I was like what is the root? <laughs> um, but I think I read that uh, 10,000 people came to, like, the emperor's funeral, you know. And I kind of wondered, you know, is the San Francisco of past a more fascinating place? Were there more interesting characters then or now? Did I, you come up with a conclusion? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got it all figured out. Like, uh, wouldn't 10,000 people go to anyone's funeral? Anyone's. The mayor's, anyone's, let alone a homeless person. Right. Yeah, I mean, for Norton, the, uh, the, the procession was several miles long, I think, as they were going up to uh, Lone Mountain, or Laurel Hill, I guess, is, is where he was. Um, and, uh, yeah, I do think it was more interesting then. I mean, I'm sure just all of history feels that way because it's in black and white, mm -hmm. if it's in, you know, photographs at all. Uh, my wife and I were just uh, up in North Beach yesterday. They had a bunch of shots on the wall just of... Guys in the 30s and 40s, you know, those, those eras where everybody wore hats. And so I have this theory that everything stopped being interesting when people stopped wearing hats. That somehow hats are, are, are at the core. Anyway, it's, it's a work in progress, this sure. theory. Um, <laughs> but uh, no, there is something about, about the past in general, and in particular San Francisco's past. Mm. It's just so colorful. Mm. Um, and. It would be fun to be a part of it. Wouldn't it be great? Yeah. 1880s. It's a wild time. You got things like, um, you know, the, young, the younger Spreckles boy, soon to become the, the sugar trillionaire when his father left him the company, um, goes down to the offices of the Chronicle because uh, Michael D. Young, the Chronicle editor, has written an article suggesting that um, Spreckles' sugar company is engaging in fraud. Well, uh, Mr. Spreckles, 27 years old, walks into the Chronicle offices, pulls out his gun, and puts about five bullets in Michael DeYoung. Right. And he's subdued by other Chronicle staffers. Um, I mean, it's just like this incredibly cinematic moment that uh, the newspaper articles of the time captured. Yeah. That was San Francisco in the 1880s. Now we have comments on SF Gate. <laughs> right, right. Uh, right. <laughs> it's not as dramatic. Now, I remember there was one day, um, we were, you and I were walking down Haight Street, and um, you, were, you were well into your book. You were probably at least three years into it, and um, three of eight. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we were, you were at least three years into it, and you, we were walking down Haight Street, and you were like, Adam, Adam, I've got it, I've got it. The ghosts are going to talk. <laughs> and I remember thinking, oh, God. <laughs> Doug, the painkillers. You've got to get off the painkillers, is what I was thinking. But it turned out to like add a dimension to the book that was so amazing. Um, it really seems to start off as Mike's book, and I can tell you that was where the seed was, and you began it that way. When did you include multiple perspectives? When did you decide to open it up to everything? It was after a couple of years of working on it, I think. Um, and I, I just, f I don't know that I really approached it you know, very intellectually, or um, I, I think I just had the sense that there were more stories that I wanted to tell. I wanted to be able to go with Toronto and see what he was going through in his relationship. I wanted to be able to spend some time with Fiona apart from Mercer, um, especially because who she was with Mercer. I mean, they're both a little broken when they're together for a lot of the book. Um, so I did, I did want to see what she would do on her own. Um, and I... And I thought, well, and then there's Jude. Jude's got his own narrative. He's a 16-year-old kid trying to figure out who he is. Um, and I thought, well, I'm going to trust that the novel is big enough to hold all of these. Um, because, yeah, my intent had been to write a really like simple, streamlined, Mercer-centric book. Yeah, it just it didn't work out that way. And then dead people started coming in, and it all just it, it went nuts. Um, 
900 pages, Doug. Yeah, I, I don't know what I was thinking. Yeah. I, I got into not, well, the, the fun of working with the dead is I got to work with history, do the research, invent emotional lives for these people, um, and I also got to invent the rules of this world. You know, why are they walking around there? When do they leave? Why do they leave? Um, and then on top, I think I, I got so caught up in that, then I started creating more and more of that world. I, I created their economic system. I created like a gang rivalry for Pruno distribution, right? I mean, it, <laughs> a massive socialist uprising of right. dead root miners. I mean, it, it, uh, all of which I think, I still think is kind of cool, but it, um, <laughs> God bless anyone who'd read that book. I mean, it... it DVD notes, that's what they'll be. <laughs> uh, well, it would be nice. But it's that but, kind of obsession um, that it takes to make a novel. Eight years. Eight years of nonstop uh, Im psychological immersion in the lives of others until they become real people. And I just know myself as a, as a writer, um, you know, it's a strange relationship. It's part like having a child. It's part like melding yourself with another in, a, in an intimate relationship. And then, of course, it ends in the same way that parenthood and marriage don't. And you kind of move on to other things. I don't think there's a relationship quite like it. Uh, but I will say that when I was writing my book, and this was before I had kids, I had never really kind of been obsessed with death before until I got deep into my novel. And then I started to think daily about death. Um, and, you know, I called a friend and I was like, buddy, if I get hit by a bus, here's the, here is the password to my Gmail account where I save a copy of my novel every day. And you must finish it. You must swear to me in writing that you'll finish it. And Neil was like, buddy, are you painkillers? Are you on painkillers? <laughs> and he, he agreed. And um, I, I never thought about dying until I wrote a novel. And I could feel the contemplation of death constantly in this book. Yeah, and I, I thought about it a lot, too. And in fact, I was just paralyzed with fear that I'd get hit by a bus. And, and they would, you know, this book was sold long before it was written. And I was afraid that, you know, oh my God, the editor, the publisher, they're going to want to go into my computer and see what I've actually produced. And they'll realize I was a complete fraud. And <laughs> that will be my legacy. I'm dead and a fraud. Um, so it was kind of a relief to get it done. Because uh, now if I die, well, hey, there, there's the book. <laughs> sure. It's all right. If only you'd had a friend to warn you not to sell a book before you write it. Yes, if only. Um, when we were... Uh, Stegner Fellows together, Adam uh, on his first book tour had met a writer named Tony Early who's uh, someone whose short stories that I love uh, very much and Adam was telling me that Tony Early had gone through this, he sold a novel that wasn't written and he went through seven years of just agony. Stained glass. Oh really? Yeah, he did stained <laughs> glass for five years he said. Because of the terror of having sold a book without written it. Right. Right. And Adam said, Doug, advice, never sell a book that isn't written. And I said, oh, that's, that's swell advice, Adam. And then, sure. and then my agent said, okay, we've got a buyer for the book. And I was like, right on. <laughs> I'd um, never say I told you so well. It's not like <laughs> me. I'm classier than that. And, and I was aware of it. I was like, I'm going to work on this. I'm going to work through it. I'm going to show Adam that it can be done. And, and I remember, I think you told me it was seven years for early. Yes. And then uh, when year seven of this novel rolled around, I was like, oh my God, it's worse for me. <laughs> I did worse. Um, so anyway, don't ever sell a book that isn't written, please. Um, I just, I don't take directions well. I got, I got another question for you, Doug. One of the interesting things about the book is um, these uh, police forms, mem memoranda. Uh, one of the assignments I have for my students is to, you know, write through official discourse, you know, and uh, it's a kind of writing in which you're not supposed to let anything personal into it, whether it's an office memo or a police report, um, and yet, of course, it always does. And it's an exercise in withholding, and our mutual friend, Dana Roscoe, uh, has kind of done a couple famous examples yeah. of this um, to wonderful effect. But I think about you as a lawyer. A, being a deeply creative, deeply feeling artist in the realm of law school and completing law school. And I kind of wonder if that tension between 
wanting to create but having to write in a certain way. Has it come out of the books in some way? Can you speak to what it was like to be a writer in law school? Uh, actually, the, I wasn't a writer in law school. I got to law school and shut down completely creatively. Um, it was really, I mean, in part because it's a lot of work, but also I just, um, I didn't have that side of my brain uh, working. Um, and uh, it was, and in fact, I don't think I've ever been able to harmonize those two, um, those two sides. Uh, I actually did practice law for a year and I left it to take the Stegner Fellowship. And I think the first two months of the fellowship, I couldn't write anything because I was still in this very sort of linear analytical world and I couldn't do the associative kind of thinking that I needed to do. It, it had atrophied a little. Um, so it's, it's not really easy for me to move between those worlds. Yeah. But it was a lot of fun to get into it in those police reports. Um, and my, my friend the cop was really, he was really into writing. And he, he really prided himself on being able to write a damn good incident report. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, and, and, you know, and the whole point was like simple declarative sentences, you know? And uh, it's an interesting way of seeing the world. It's an interesting way of trying to render action in a book. Um, and it was a tricky question sometimes. Like, there, I had to decide, okay, do I want to do this scene in a police report or do I want to do it in more traditional narration? Uh, you certainly get a more vivid experience with the traditional narration, but there was something about working in that form that felt right. Mm -hmm. But there's definitely a cost. Mm -hmm. um, so, and I don't know that I would make every decision the same way if I were spending another eight years oh, yeah. on the book. There's yeah. much that I would change about my novel yeah. as well. Um, but you know, character management is such a difficult thing. You know, I don't want to get too t kind of technical, but you know, when I would write a scene in my novel and there were six or seven characters on stage, you had to keep the reader aware that they were all there and someone would have to pipe up and, oh, it's my turn to say something or you forgot about me or give everyone like ridiculous juggling actions to do. And I was like, oh, I would like do anything to get a couple off stage. Hey, we're going to go on a beer run. I was like, oof, I got rid of three. Um, and of course, obligatory scenes. A big wedding scene is always hard to do because they're cliched or things that readers have seen before. And you had this giant showdown at the end of this book. But doing it through the police reports saved you 50 pages at least. <laughs> it did. And actually, I had, in fact, tried it in the traditional. That, that was part of the 900 in, in the first iteration of the book. Um, yeah. That, so overwhelming. It, it it's really hard. Um, any so choreographing physical movement and action, mm -hmm. it can really bog a book down if, if you're not really on it, not doing it really, really crisply and clearly. Um, so in a way, doing it in the police report, you know, I have the little critical voice that says I punked out a little by doing it that way instead of really committing to the full narration. Um, but I also think, you know, it's a form that I was using and it made sense for the form, you know, this, this form of the incident report to occupy some significant place um, when the events of the book were, were coming together. I think you were wise. I mean, you did write it all out and your little voice said, no, not that way. You know? At the end of my book, I was like, I have one character too many and I went on this I exercised a character called Big Daddy. <laughs> what was I thinking? <laughs> he gave me the three quarters of the book and I had to go through and erase every single trace of him. You just don't, you know, search and replace Big Daddy. <laughs> um, but I felt so relieved that I got rid of that character. Mm -hmm. I was a little lighter. Did you make any big changes at the end? Any big terror moves? Not, not at the very end. The, the big decisions at the very end were, um, I mean, it, actually, it was all about what's going to happen to Jude. Um, I felt like there were several different options with him. And um, I've actually since found an entry in one of my notebooks that uh, had an idea for what I think is a better ending. Mm -hmm. And uh, at my eureka moment in discovering it was only about two years too late. Uh -huh. um, but that's okay. You know, I, I like what's there. Um, the, there was a big decision about 300 pages in, I, I had been writing the book in past tense and that little voice started talking, uh, and I, I had, I had been reading a book by Stuart Onan called The Night Country, which is, has this real dark, spooky kind of vibe to it. 
Um, and it was in present tense. And I looked at it and I said, oh, that's the vibe that I want. And, and I, I, the verb tense is a big part of establishing this feel. I was like, okay, do I go back? And again, it's not just search and replace the verbs. You know, I gotta reconstruct the whole thing. So, you know, do I go back and do 300 pages of rewriting? And I said, I, I guess I have to. I wasn't happy about it. I knew that like, I was committing the next six months of my life to redoing stuff that I had just done. Um, but it felt right. Mm. One thing I think you were blessed with is having a real old school editor in Sean McDonald at Riverhead. He's not old, um, but he has a belief system of how a book should uh, be fostered through fostering a young artist. And uh, he stuck by your side year after year, even after changing houses, yeah. which is unheard of. It's really, really rare. Um, my editor uh, had been with Doubleday, Doubleday's who originally bought the book, and he went over to Riverhead and he took the book with him. And we know many, many people who've written fantastic books that you know, the editor, for their own personal reasons, has, has made this career move, and the book is orphaned at the old publishing house. Mm -hmm. And you know, sure, some editor gets assigned to pick it up and work with it, but they've got no investment in it. Mm -hmm. um, they don't love it in the way that the other editor did. And so the book gets lost when it comes out. You know, there's no juice behind it. Um, I'm extremely lucky that, that Sean stuck with me. And, and he, you know, he really gave me the space he would every now and then, you know, apply a little pressure for some progress here or here. Um, but I, I think I needed, uh, I needed that room. Um, because I don't think the characters really started making sense to me until year five or six, which probably sounds insane. Yeah. Um, but, but yeah, there were still important discoveries to be made then. And honestly, if I'd not taken all eight years, I, I don't think the book would have been any good at all. I think when you're making real people out of whole cloth, that's what it takes. And it's easy to kind of inherit or borrow or steal or pastiche characters that readers have seen out there in the world. But if you're going to create someone, um, they should be like real friends. And I think a real good friend you're still getting to know after a couple years. And they can still surprise you. And they'll say that one thing about their past that you didn't know. And there it is. And um, and there's even some left on the table that you're probably still coming to. I saw in this, God, this is the dang nicest book I've ever <laughs> seen. I saw in this, um, and I'm not going to ask you what the root is, um, but there's your playlist. Oh, yeah. This Talk is, about, you know, music. You listen to music when you write, yes? I, I often do. Um, I mean, sometimes it's, it's the last thing that I should be doing. Sometimes I need absolute silence, but... Um, yeah, I put this playlist together for a website. It's largeheartedboy.com, and they ask writers to write about music and musicians to write about books. Um, and some people do it as a, you know, a soundtrack for their books, kind of scene by scene, what the ambient music would be like. For me, it was, OK, here are the songs that I, I do this crazy OCD thing sometimes where I put a, one song on infinite repeat, yeah. and I have it up really, really loud. And I generally do this when the words aren't coming and I'm a little angry with myself and it's a way of like forcing words onto the screen and just and um, trying to write with fury when writing with calm isn't working. I like that. So, um, so this, this playlist, uh, it contains, it's all songs that were part of the infinite repeat um, roster, I guess, over the eight years of the book. Um, and some of them are very sort of mellow and haunting, but some are kind of punky and attitude filled. And uh, yeah, there were a lot of nights where like, I'm at the coffee shop at four in the morning, my wife is home asleep, I've got four classes to teach the next day, nothing's coming out, uh, I, I just was so sleep deprived I drove the car into the house. Um, and you know, a little, a little bit of punked up music was, was just the thing. How did you make it out of this book, Doug? I, mean, I, I don't know. I'm not going to write another one, are you? <laughs> don't do I, it. <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> um, well, I, I would like to think I know a little more about, if not how to do it, because I'm, I'm thinking that you have to relearn with every book how that book wants to be written. But I think I at least have gotten to know myself a little better such that I can avoid, um, I can get myself out of the pits more easily mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to 
just falling into them for weeks or months at a time. Mm -hmm. um, Know thyself, huh? <laughs> I do. I've never listened to music before uh, when I write, but um, as you know, I'm writing this book set in North Korea, and um, I will listen to music sometimes if it's another language. It doesn't distract me if it's Portuguese or Spanish. And on the DPRK Central website, they have all this propaganda music uh, oh. glorifying Kim Il Sung and Kim Jong Il, of course. And you can download the MP3s for free. And uh, I do have these like huge playlist a big brassy propaganda music mm. in honor of Kim Jong-il. And sometimes <laughs> I'll sit in the library for like 10 hours listening to that, and you don't want to talk to me afterwards, really. <laughs> so. And does, I mean, does it, do you, do you find that it, it has influenced the prose that comes out, that you sort of get that? Um, I don't know if I can identify the, the scene, uh, the scenes that I listen to that music or not, but, um, it's you know, turned into, now that I have three kids, I've turned into a, a person who can't write in my house, and I write in the public libraries. And uh, UCSF is close <laughs> to me. I use that one. Uh, sometimes the Park Branch is my branch, uh, in Coal Valley. Um, sometimes the Mechanics Institute is a nice uh, library downtown. Um, but there's often lots of noise and stuff, so I'll listen to things going on. And um, I, I guess I use... I do get into a strange North Korean trance when I put on <laughs> that music. And you know, it's weird. You look on your iTunes and it's like that one song has been played 247 times. You're like, my God, I've just been through like a, a grade school year of North Korea, <laughs> really, in terms of indoctrination. <laughs> I'm gonna go crazy. Too, it's kind of crazy. What I we mean, do. you're four and a half. Yeah, four and a half is nothing. Yeah, <laughs> I scoff at your four and a half. <laughs> now you, you know, when I um, I know you're working on short stories right now. They're such different animals. It's so difficult to go from one to the other, and you know, I don't remember the famous writer who said, you know, never write short stories because you waste all your good. Beginnings and endings, you know. Um, what's it like to make the transition back to the short form? It's, I think it was a little trickier than I had thought it was going to be. I, th I think I had this sense that, um, that it would be, uh, that I'd be so relieved to be finished with the novel and finished with that form that I would just fall right into it. And I had like notebooks full of story ideas. And I, I had a, I've had a hard time actually getting back into that into that mode. What helped a lot is that I um, went and re-edited some older stories that are going to be in the collection. I wanted to make sure that um, you know that they stood up, that they didn't feel dated, and that they didn't feel too juvenile. Um, you know that it was still my language, my voice, the writer that I am now. Um, you know, try to harmonize that with the story being from a, a certain time. Um, so that helped. You know that that's those are that's training wheels kind of work. Um, getting into the stories and working with them again, um, and it, yeah, it's just going one by one. Um, it's I think now I'm at the point where it is easier to think of it as, um, I, uh, you know, it's a, it's a shorter, it's a much shorter commitment. It's um, it's a finite little project. One year, one year <laughs> instead of eight. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm having fun with it. I actually started the second novel over the summer, mm -hmm. um, and uh, I'm looking forward to getting back to it. It's, it's a little on the back burner right now, but um, I, I think it'll be fun to work in that expansive realm again, you know, where you can have characters like Glenn, you know, making jokes about lifting from your knees. And right. like, you can't do that in a short story. <laughs> Glenn can't occupy a page in a short right. story. Um, <laughs> But, but in a novel, you have that kind of freedom. Uh, and that's a really fun way to write, when you can just you know, find everything that might be there and throw it in and see what sticks. So you're writing short stories and a novel at the same time? Yeah, yeah. yeah. But I mean, the novels, it's, it's ongoing, sure. but a little less active mm. than it might be. But that's, that was one of the things that working on the play helped me with. I realized I'm much better when I'm sort of moving from project to project and actually forcing myself to, to, to try to be that nimble mm -hmm. uh, instead of just getting lost in the big monolithic commitment. Mm -hmm. 
I know you've been blessed to have some great, great mentors, you know, at Stanford and Iowa and at Stanford again. Are you, um, do you have students under your wing now? Or do you have some students you're I, passing things on to? I do. Um, I got to work with some fantastic students at, through Stanford Continuing Studies, uh, one of whom is in the audience now as a Stegner Fellow himself. I would like to say that I recognized his talent earlier than anybody. <laughs> it might be a lie, but I'm going to say it anyway. Um, <laughs> his stuff was really good. Um, and I've got uh, some students from CCA, the master's program, who are still writing, um, you know, really trying, trying to make it. And the undergrads that I'm working with now um, at St. Edward's University, it's a little university, I, you know, and I, I assumed that I had gotten spoiled at Stanford, that I wouldn't see, you know, really quality student work. And they've really blown me away. Um, there are some kids there who are really, really into it, and they've got the chops. Wow. They are far ahead of where I was as an undergrad. Um, it's almost a bit frightening. Wow. Um, but I try to hold back the fear and, and, and dispense wisdom. I know the... <laughs> I know my uh, Stanford students are so sophisticated. They're so aware. They've read. They're cultured. You know, and with them, I always found that subtlety you know, was the paragon of writing. And that any time you were obvious, that was the greatest sin. And they'd always write these beautiful, well-crafted stories. And we didn't know what happened. You know? <laughs> um, but you know, I taught in Louisiana for a couple years. And um, uh, you know, my students there, you know, my God, they would write stories, you know. I'd ask a student, like, hey, how come you didn't come to class? He's like, well, you know, my dad had his parole hearing, but our bass boat blew up on the way, and, you know, my crossbow went off, and I got to deal with that, you know. And so there's something about, um, you know, students in Texas, Louisiana, other places. Well, Doug, I just want to say, um, you know, I hope we haven't scared people by talking about eight years and things like this to make a book. Uh, for people who are writers out there and working on their own. But uh, it seems to me there are writers who don't write from themselves, who research, who are like, I'm going to write about, uh, um, you know, submarines in Antarctica. And they go research stuff and they do it. And then there are writers who write from deep personal experience, from the chronic aches and yearnings that they have across a lifetime, who are trying to make people and have fully realized relationships with them. And that takes a kind of time that other people can't often understand. And you're one of those writers who are kind of deeply, deeply curious about the human experience and are trying to portray it in a wholly new and original way. And um, Thank you. that's why your book's so fabulous. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks, man. Um, can we take some questions from the audience? Who, where's, someone's got the mic. Is it on? It is. Right. I saw a hand. Passed the hand. Thank you for writing that book. I thought you took on so much, but you pulled it off. Um, Thank you. And I'm here with my book club members, and we we always do one city, one book. So this was a great pick. All right. Thank you. Okay. Um, I just had um, a comment, and then I got to ask about Raina. But first, the comment. Um, you brought it up about you know the end of the book, toward the end of the book, and resolving the um, dead conflict and the um, officer. That was a huge relief for me. I didn't find that to be a shortcut because when I saw it, you got the reader in such a frenzy, things are going wild at this point, that I'm like, oh my God, he's alive, thank God. That was the first reaction I had. If he wrote the report, he lived. So thank you. Great. I didn't have to suffer, you know, I was already <laughs> in frenzy. So um, I liked that. It was easier on me. Raina, I was, that was the only thing I felt like, you know, you should write me into the book so I can slap her personally, because I really <laughs> found, um, that was one thing I thought, well, maybe he's going to do another book and it's going to be all about her. So what, um, she's an interesting character, if you could tell us a little bit more about creating her. Yeah, uh, she was, uh, so Raina is the, um, the girl that, that Jude is head over heels in love with in that 16-year-old way, and, um, you know, and she's young too. She, she's still, you know, she recognizes the power that she has over him. And that's, you know, I think a pretty big realization. And she's someone who, um, I mean, it, it was, I didn't want anybody to be purely evil or um, sociopathic 
in the book. Um, but she does make some decisions that are pretty disturbing and pretty cold. Um, but what I was trying to do with her was actually, um, I, I wanted to, to make it possible for, for someone to have some empathy for her, or at least to understand why she was doing what she did. And um, you know, a lot of you know, where she ends up, and uh, you know, I don't want to give it away, but... Um, They've all read the book, Doug. Not, not all. Oh, really? Maybe not all. Oh, I just assumed they'd all read the book. <laughs> Okay. But Sorry. just in case, um, that you know, I think it's something that she she can't deal with. She doesn't have the wherewithal to deal with what she really needs to deal with in order to be a sort of um, moral adult. Um, I liked writing her. I, I mean, I I don't know. I certainly wouldn't take her out to dinner, um, and I certainly wouldn't ex you know trust her to look after my cats. Uh, <laughs> but, but I, you know, I, I did want to get into her story and, and sort of show what that push and pull with Jude was. Um, and as for her actions at the end of the book, a little reprehensible, yes. Um, but I also understood them. You know, I understood why she would uh, behave that way. Sorry, that was kind of a long, rambly answer. Uh, okay. Oh no! <laughs> Sorry. Did the book no. club yeah. figure out the root? <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. The root. The, the that's what that's what ho we had some discussions about turning the book into a TV series, and all the Hollywood people were like, "Okay, the root. How does the root work? What's the root?" <laughs> there, it's it's really really just like blunt and and direct, and I'm like, "Well, it's kind of the you know and, and Hollywood metaphor. Yeah, Hollywood has no use for that. Right. They're like, give me an answer." Um, and uh, The Root was a contrivance. I, I needed a way to account for the fact that not everyone who was ever buried in coma was there, because that would get kind of crowded. Um, and, uh, and I thought, well, you know what? I'm gonna have my dead people make the choice every day to remain you know, alive and walking around. They've gotta have a reason to keep doing this. And some of them, many of them, will get to the point where it's just not worth it anymore. And The Root is a sort of final exit um, device for them. I don't know what plant it is the root of. Uh, I, I sure didn't want to get into that. My wife is a botanist. I would never be able to fool her with it. Um, so I said, well, it's just the root, capital R root. Let's go with it. R, yeah. 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 Any other questions? So, Doug, you, you said earlier that you don't take directions very well, and um, both you and Adam were in workshop together. Um, can you talk a little bit about what it's like to, I mean, not all novelists come up with their novels in a workshop situation, and what it's like a little bit to, um, to workshop um, a long project to take directions or not, and especially, I mean, if you're taking directions from Tobias Wolf, you know, where do you say no? <laughs> you know? And I, that kind of I think that's one of the hardest things about, about writing is trying to figure out where that, that balance is between you know, being porous and open to voices from the outside who can help you and also knowing where it's yours and where you are not gonna bend. Um, I do think it's probably, um, it's probably best not to workshop a first draft of a novel or, you know, before it's completed. I think it, it probably makes sense just get to the end, have it be your own thing, let it come out that way. Um, because I think too many voices too early on might push you in some wrong directions. Um, and I, it's hard, I don't think there's any real answer. I think you, you have to kind of look deeply and, and just figure out what's most important to you. And it might be that some of those things are not things that are working yet. And in doing that, you're saying, okay, I'm committing to this, but I'm, I might have to do it really differently, um, but I'm gonna make it work. Uh, and that, it's scary. Uh, I, ha I have no great answer. Do you? I remember I workshopped a chapter with John LaRue, uh, who's a professor of fiction writing at Stanford and author of like 18 books now, I think. And um, I turned into a chapter and 
we were about to discuss it on our day, and I was a little nervous, and he's a little bit, of, he's got a dark streak in him, <laughs> and he certainly knows when he has power over you. Uh, he's a wonderful, wonderful teacher, but he said, we were about to start, he said, um, he put his hands on the table, he's like, of course, everyone understands how absolutely dangerous it is to workshop a chapter of a novel in progress. <laughs> it's really fool's work, actually. <laughs> I would never do it myself, and I'd never advise anyone to ever do it. <laughs> but Adam's put this before us, and he knows what he's gotten himself into. Let us begin. <laughs> <laughs> Holy shit. <laughs> And then it was wonderful. It was wonderful. I remember, um, you know, reading Adam's stories in workshop, uh, and you know, I I love Adam's work, and I, I have from the very first one I saw in workshop, and uh, but I remember writing you comments. I remember hating the ending of the Eighth Sea, mm -hmm. uh, which is one of the stories in Adam's collection, and I think I wrote something sort of very vociferously to that end, and I I just took it out again. I just taught it to my class. Oh, thank you. Um, and I, I encountered that ending again, and I was like, oh my God, I was so wrong. I was an idiot. This ending is perfect. Well, thank you. I finally get now, eight years later, what Adam was doing way back then. I saved those angry comments, man. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes I unwrap them. Yeah. But you know, sometimes when you, when, when you, you, love, when you love what a person's doing, it's like you, you really get invested in, in wanting to help shape it. Um, but thank you for not listening to me. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> on the uh, on the topic of endings, I'm I'm back here. Oh, there you go. Okay. I haven't read your book yet, Doug, but I look forward to out. <laughs> <laughs> I look forward to jumping in. Uh, you mentioned, and maybe this is a silly question, but you mentioned that you discovered in your notebook uh, an alternative ending, and I'm thinking of the various movies that we see that do have a second ending, and I'm wondering if you've considered writing a second ending for your readers? I've considered it ever so briefly. And then I get the voice that comes in and starts reminding me, that book took eight years. <laughs> and you might think you're going to write a new ending really quickly. That'll be like three more years. And you have other things to do. And you have a family to feed. Um, and so yeah, I mean, you, you just sort of have to make your peace with the project's over. I'm a writer. I got to write other things. Um, so I think it's going to have to remain a theoretical exercise. Yes, sir. Oh, it was, um, yeah, she was really, really drunk and squeezed into pants that she should not have been wearing. Ow. Which is... <laughs> Let it out. That's, um, that was actually a, a chapter that was kind of weird to work with because it, if anywhere in the book it comes close to like judging people or, or having fun at people's expense, that's, that's the one. And, and there's a degree to which I'm not quite comfortable with it. But that was also a story that my cop friend told me. Uh, he had, in fact, been working security up at Seton Hospital. And there was the girl trapped in the jeans, and there was the projectile button. And I was like, I am going to work this into the novel some way. Because how could I not? Um, but yeah, there's a little, a little comic relief there. Um. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I'm curious about a timeline. You have a master's in writing and then your law degree. Did the law degree came after your master's? No, the law oh. degree came before. I went straight from undergrad to law school because that was what my parents wanted me to do, and I, was, I had no idea that it was actually my task to figure out for myself what I wanted to do. Um, they made it very easy. You know, and, and it was this slippery slope of chronic achievement. It was like, take the LSAT, Doug. Well, okay, I'm good at standardized tests. I'll fill in some dots. And I did well. I was like, well, you have to apply and see where you can get in. You know, and I was buying into it. It's like, oh yeah, feather in my cap. Um, <laughs> but that's not, uh, it was not a successful strategy for me um, as, as a way to live. So I was in law school. Uh, I did finish. But uh, it was uh, during my third year. I had not, all of my classmates had jobs. Um, I, I hadn't even gotten a sniff of a job. I was incredibly depressed. I had hair out to here. I had poor grades. I mean, I was a, a walking disaster. I would not have hired me. Um, and yet I was baffled 
about not having a job. Anyway, um, I actually found out from a college friend that a mutual friend of ours from Stanford, who is actually sitting in the room right now, this is Ben of Fool's Fury, um, uh, that Ben was in Iowa doing the Iowa Writers Workshop. And, and I had this moment uh, where, I, I mean, I've been broken down to little pieces at this point. And I said, why does Ben get to go have fun and, and do creative, th and I'm doing this? And then, and it, it was just this little twist where I was like, oh, wait a minute, I can do that too. I mean, it's amazing, like this paradigm shift. It should have been obvious years before. Um, so I just put off studying for exams. I dug out my old stories, I worked on them. I put in an application um, and got lucky, it worked out. And uh, Ben and I lived in a farmhouse for a year in Iowa and I got to think of myself as a writer, which was a great relief after law school. Then I practiced, I came back and practiced law for a year. There were bills to pay, student loans. And I also kind of thought, well, having done these three years, I at least have to try it. So I practiced for a year. Um, with varying degrees of success and ignominious failure. Um, Death penalty cases? No, <laughs> no, thank God, no. No, no, they, they, I, couldn't, I was not put into places where I could do any harm. Uh, it was just document <laughs> review and such. Uh, and then I got the call. Uh, they said, we have a Stegner Fellowship for you. And I said, okay, I'm out of here. And uh, it's actually a decision I've never regret. I have yet to... I'm a man of many worries, and this is not a decision that I've ever worried over. Um, it felt right then, and it has felt right for the last 10 years. I think we have time for one more question. Oh, there's two hands. Okay, I'll, I'll go quickly. Three hands. We crisp answers. Lindsay, you'll choose well. Hello. Uh, I have a question about the way that you write. Do you write in a linear fashion from beginning to end, or do you like have like inspire inspirations from dreams and you're like oh that's chapter there and I, I generally do write linearly except when I get stuck and I feel like in order to continue I need to jump ahead and work on this scene that I know is needs to happen um, but I do better actually working sequentially like that and the pieces may get mixed and matched later um, but yeah I I work a little traditionally like that can we squeeze in one under the wire okay great I thought the strongest part of the book was the juxtaposition of Mercer and Fiona and them using one another as a sort of foil to figure out who it is that they wanted and trying to make each, each other you know, work in it. Talk a little bit about those characters. Uh, the the Mercer-Fiona relationship was really, really difficult to work with. Um, it, uh, and in fact, my, my wife read an early draft of it and she put it down and she said, you are not treating Fiona well enough. She is not, you're not treating her with the dignity that the character needs to have. She was a little too much of a sad sack, a little too um, uh, reactive uh, and, and not strong enough. And she pointed out, it, it only works, it only makes sense if she's got some strength such that we can believe in her and then we can believe in Mercer at least being torn about wanting to be with her, you know, that, that he might want to. Um, and also that's the only way that, that the relationship is gonna offer anything rich to the story. Um, so the, the third draft of the book, one of the big focuses for me was, was building up this, I mean, I, had, I changed the whole relationship in that, in that third draft. Um, and I tried to give her a little more, um, you know, gravitas and, and energy and um, you know, the, she could push back. You know, she wasn't just going to be pushed. Um, I, I don't know if this is answering the question. Is it okay? Um, but yeah, it's a it's a tricky relationship. They both kind of want it, but also kind of don't. And and I I did want the relationship to live in that uncomfortable world where it's not necessarily clear who you ought to be with or who, who you ought to avoid being with. Um, and you know, and, and where they end up is, um, what, can I say this? I suppose, y'all know. I mean, it, it's neither magic, happy, fairy tale ending. It's, it's not doom and misery. Um, 
it's what felt real to me, which is they make this decision and they're going to do their best with that decision and keep moving forward. Well, thank you. All right. I guess we're wrapping up. Doug, thanks for coming out tonight. Thanks for writing a great book. Thank you. Thank you for hosting. And thank you for. <laughs> thanks for all the advice I ignored. <laughs> um, and thanks to all of you for coming out. Really appreciate it. And thanks again to Fool's Fury. <laughs> Doug, would, um, Doug would be happy to sign copies of your book. So. Um, Maybe you can say a word to him in person as he inscribes your copy. Yeah, I think it, we're doing it somewhere out back there. Okay. Thanks for everyone who came out on a rainy night. Yeah.